here's Ryan O'Neill. And glad to have on with us uh, live this morning, Dr. Uh, Gary Ostrauer, a longtime Alfred University history professor. Lots going on in the news, lots going on in this day in history, so always glad to have Dr. Ostrauer on. Well, good morning to you. Well, Dr. Ostrauer, uh, in current events, um, uh, a, a general made a statement about President Trump. President Trump uh, went on Fox last night. Talk to Sean Hannity. Um, Israel, the prime minister, has stepped down in Canada. Uh, Trudeau's been reelected. Where would you like to start? Well, I, we might as well start with uh, President Trump. I did not hear his uh, statement on the Sean Hannity show, uh, but I do. Uh, I did read the statement that uh, General McRaven had made. William McRaven, General, uh, actually, should not General McRaven, uh, Admiral McRaven, uh, was the uh, Navy and uh, uh, commander of the United States Special uh, Operations Command. Uh, he also then, after he retired from the Navy, uh, became the Chancellor, which is you know kind of the CEO of the University of Texas. Texas system. Uh, he had a long career in the uh, in the Navy. Uh, many many friends. He talked about a uh, uh, ceremony at uh, the um, uh, the Office of Strategic Services Society uh, for a number of other four star uh, admirals. Uh, and he said something there that I thought was of special significance in light of the uh, impeachment probe of uh, of uh, President Trump. Uh, you know, he said the following. He said uh, this. He said at Fort Bragg that uh, one of his friends, again, a four-star general, has said, I don't like the Democrats, he said, but Trump is destroying the republic. And then Admiral McRaven went on to say that if we don't care about our values, if we don't care about duty and honor, if we don't help the weak and stand up against oppression and injustice, he said, what will happen to the Kurds, to the Iraqis, to the Afghans, to the Syrians, to the Rohingyas, to the South Sudanese, and to millions of other people under the boot of tyranny were left abandoned by their failing states. And of course, he's referring here to the fact that President Trump has abandoned, uh, for no good reasons, has abandoned the Kurds in Syria. So McRaven went on to say that if our promises are meaningless, how will our allies ever trust us? If we can't have faith in our nation's principles, why would the men and women of this nation join the military in the first place? In other words, you know, we, we, we have a situation that is really unparalleled in American, in American history. And while President Trump has many people who, you know, enjoy uh, the way he insults President Obama, President Obama and others, uh, you know, we're really in trouble. We have a president right now who in many ways is undermining some of the fundamental principles constitutional principles, as well as foreign policy principles uh, that have guided our nation for, to a certain extent, the last 240 years, and certainly in respect to foreign policy since World War II. And so McRaven ends his comments by saying that if the president doesn't understand their importance, if this president doesn't demonstrate the leadership that America needs, then it's time for a new person in the Oval Office, Republican, Democrat, or Independent. And the sooner the better, he said, the fate of our republic depends upon it. Uh, I can't remember. I just don't remember when a uh, leading member of the American military has made this kind of a statement. Uh, so, you know, whatever Sean Hannity may be saying these days, because after all, you know, he's really been a uh, kind of an advisor to President Trump. Uh, uh, you know, I think the rest of us have a lot to consider, a lot to worry about uh, in light of recent developments in American foreign policy. What do you make of uh, Netanyahu stepping down in Israel, Dr. Ostrauer? Well, he didn't quite step down. What he said is that he is unable to form a government, and consequently the president of Israel has asked his main opponent in the recent election, a man by the name of Benny Gantz, also a, you know, with a military background, uh, to form a government. And if I'm not mistaken, Gantz has about 28 days to do this. The problem is that, you know, in the recent election, uh, Netanyahu and Gantz were more or less tied, and therefore, and neither got a majority. So they have to put together a government by aligning with certain other smaller, sometimes we call them splinter parties. Uh, Netanyahu was unable to do this. 
now Gantz will have an opportunity to, you know, to put together a coalition government. But my hunch, and again, you know, I'm <laughs> not so great about reading the future. My hunch is that he's going to be unable to do it as well, because he would have to put together a coalition government that includes some far right Israeli uh, 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 you know, kind of religious parties, along with uh, some of the Arab, uh, the, the, the one Arab party, about 19 percent of the population of Israel is, is, uh, is Arab. And they very much participated in this recent election. And I don't know that we're going to be able to get together to ever see a coalition government that includes both the Arab parties as well as some of the right wing religious parties. And if that happens, if I'm correct about that, that Gantz is unable to put that together, there's going to be a third election in the, you know, just the past few months. So, uh, you know, stay tuned on this one. What's the difference between Netanyahu and Gantz? What's, what was the choice for the Israeli people there? Well, the Gantz was, uh, well, let me go back to uh, Netanyahu. Netanyahu said shortly before the election that, uh, that Israel is going to annex sections of the West Bank. Uh, he has been unwilling in any way to accommodate the Arab population of Israel. It's really a hardline expansionist kind of policy. Uh, Gantz is much more of a, I guess you'd call him kind of a traditional Israeli politician, uh, although, as I say, he he does have a strong military background, so it's not as if he's giving away the ship. But by the same token, he's willing to, uh, 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 you know, to for, you know, get move into negotiations uh, with the Arab Party, and he's willing to, you know, recognize that Arabs have, uh, you know, real rights within the context of the state of Israel itself. So, you know, I don't know that I would, ex I don't want to exaggerate the differences between the two, uh, but uh, Gantz is a much more, from my perspective at least, uh, a much more sympathetic character and a much more reasonable character. Looking up the uh, headlines this morning for uh, Trudeau up in Canada, I see headlines from NPR and Fox News. Fox News, Trudeau rival says Canadian liberals are put on notice after narrow prime minister victory from NPR five hours ago in Canadian vote. Trudeau's liberals on the top but lose absolute majority. Well, uh, it's funny how people will r interpret this. One major newspaper in the United States headlined the story, uh, Trudeau uh, uh, is given a, another vote of confidence. He's, in other words, he's won the election. Narrowly, but he has won the election. He's a big winner here. One of the other major newspapers said just the opposite, that Trudeau has suffered uh, a serious defeat, even though he still is, you know, he did get a plurality, and therefore he will, you know, remain as prime minister for the next who knows how many years, three years, four years, maybe even five years. So, uh, you know, is it a real victory for Trudeau? It's a modified victory. He certainly did not get the kind of endorsement that he got uh, when he ran three years ago, four years ago, but by the same token, he will remain as prime minister. Uh, he's been chastened, and he has been, uh, I think, that a good deal of the support that he has lost comes from, number one, a scandal uh, in which he uh, may have interfered uh, with the uh, with the penalties assessed against the Canadian company uh, for illegal activities, uh, and on the other hand, uh, he was found in blackface. You know what happened to the governor of Virginia when he was when the old photo of him you know turned up with him in blackface. Well, Trudeau uh, apparently was at a party some years ago, uh, and he was in blackface. I think it was probably about 15 years ago or so. But in either case, it has discredited him, and I say discredited him in a country namely Canada, that is famously tolerant for its treatment of minority populations. Well, that wasn't enough to, you know, cost him the election, but it certainly did cost him plenty of votes, and he's therefore not going to be in as strong a position as prime minister as he had been for the last four years. Going to take a quick break and come back in just a moment with Alfred University history professor Dr. Gary Ostrower, our weekly Tuesday guest. Okay, from the start. The Osceola cherry. Alfalfa leaf, aloe vera, apples, asparagus, banana, beets, bell pepper, broccoli, blueberries, blackberries, cranberries. We make Texas superfood from 55 raw, vine-ripened fruits and vegetables, and then we add nothing. Pineapple, sweet potato, papaya, parsley. In a capsule or a powder, one daily dose of Texas superfood delivers the healthy benefits of 55. Count them. 
55 fresh fruits and vegetables, and you can see them all on TexasSuperfood.com. Raspberry, finish the nutrients that we need on a daily basis. Thousands of people benefit from taking Texas Superfood every day. Shouldn't you be one of them? Doctors, pharmacists, nurses, and your grandmother all recommend that you eat more fruits and vegetables every day. So if you can't, won't, or don't, Texas Superfood is made for you. It's borderline shocking how much energy I have. Join us on TexasSuperfood.com. 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 Checking in now with meteorologist Rob Carolyn here on this Tuesday morning in October. How's it looking, Rob? Well, it's looking kind of dreary for today, Brian. We've got a cold front headed our way and some rain associated with that. Uh, the heaviest rain is still west of the Buffalo area. So we're going to be looking at uh, like scattered showers this morning and then periods of rain for the afternoon. Temperatures today, they're going to be mild with that southerly flow. We're already mild out there this morning. I think we end up between 60 and 65. Sunrise this morning was at 732. Sun is going to set tonight at 617. Now it looks like uh, the rain will continue into the early evening before ending a few showers. Temperatures overnight 40 to 45. Brian, tomorrow it's going to turn partly sunny, but it also turns cooler. Highs 55 to 60. Partly cloudy with a low close to 40 tomorrow night. We're still under the influences of high pressure Thursday. Partial sun 60 to 65. Next weather system to affect us will be Friday. That storm this morning's in the Pacific Northwest, but by Friday it looks to bring us some showers. They should end Friday night. Thank you, meteorologist Rob Carolyn. Back to Alfred University history professor Dr. Gary Ostar. Before we get to this day in history, uh, Dr. Ostar, you wanted to say something about the whole global warming climate change issue. Yeah, I, you know, we often hear that climate change is a hoax, that there really is no uh, uh, human connection to climate change if it does in fact exist. Uh, and, uh, you know, occasionally broadcasters will mention, for instance, that there was a major snowstorm earlier than usual in Montana or in Colorado or something along those lines, as if somehow or another that just debunks the idea that climate change is real. The fact, of course, is that climate change is real. About 98% of all serious climate scientists now accept the reality, not only the reality of climate change, but the human connection to climate climate change. What I found interesting this past week was that the Federal Reserve Bank in San Francisco, its Board of Governors, issued a warning that has not been connected, you know, that has not been articulated earlier. And remember, this is at a time when I believe, if I'm not mistaken, 17 of the 18 warmest years in recorded weather history have occurred in the last 18 years. Have occurred, you know, just in, uh, you know, in, in this century. And by the same token, we are on Tack on 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 uh, uh, track right now for this year, 2019, to be the re- the hottest year in recorded history. In any case, the Federal Reserve made the following points: that home values could call could fall significantly as a result of fa- climate change. That banks could stop lending to flood prone communities uh, that are, you know, threatened by climate change, that towns could lose the tax money that they need to build seawalls and other protections. And the Federal Reserve went on to say, the Board of Governors went on to say, that coastal cities in the United States are already unable to pay for the type of protection that they need uh, against, uh, you know, in respect to flood control and so forth, and that even large affluent cities, such as New York, such as Boston, such as Miami, such as Charleston, South Carolina, currently simply do not have the financial capacity to place all of their, to fund all of the plans that they have drawn up uh, to protect themselves against flooding and so forth. So, you know, you can believe what you want, I suppose, about climate change. If you want to believe, as President Trump does, that climate Climate change, change is a hoax that has somehow been you know, uh, perpetrated by the Chinese government. I guess you could do that. I mean, if you want to believe in Santa Claus, if you want to believe in flying saucers, you can do that as well. But I think that we're going to have to come to terms with climate change, not only the economic effects, such as the Federal Reserve is focusing on right now, but the political effects as well, because it's going to mean that there are going to be migrations of populations, there's going to be uh, you know, immigration issues, and we're going to have to deal with with these, not for the next 10 years, but the next 50 or 60 or 70 years. Talking to Dr. Gary Ostrauer, moving on now to this day in history, October 22nd, 1957, the first casualties in uh, Vietnam, 13 Americans are wounded in Saigon. Dr. Ostrauer, I had a question. 
Uh, how aware were U.S. citizens of a military presence in Vietnam uh, prior to JFK and LBJ? In 1957, would, would you have known, for example, that there were troops in Vietnam? I certainly did not. I suspect that very, very few Americans knew that there were troops in Vietnam. Uh, they were not, by the way, actively involved in warfare quite yet. I mean, that would not happen until really 1960. But uh, uh, no, I think that Americans were pretty ignorant of what was happening in Vietnam. Now, that's not quite the case in respect to what happened with the French. And just a tiny bit of background here may be helpful. The French had colonized Vietnam back in the 1870s. But it was during the period after World War II, after World War II, remember, uh, the French had returned to Vietnam, which had been during the war occupied by the Japanese. The French had returned, they reestablished their colony there, and the Vietnamese nationalists, led by a guy named Ho Chi Minh, he was a nationalist, but he was also a communist, uh, led you know, what became a pretty serious war against uh, the French presence. And that war lasted for eight years. It lasted from 1946 until 1954. And it was in 1954, one of the most important battles of the entire 20th century, called the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, the Vietnamese guerrillas, you know, the, uh, the, the, the forces led by Ho Chi Minh, uh, defeated the French, and the French left within, you know, less than one year. Uh, between 19... Uh, between 1955, when the French departed, and 1960, when the Americans really do get involved in military activities, I think that most Americans were relatively uninformed about what was happening in Vietnam. And that lack of information, our ignorance of what was happening there, becomes one of the factors involved in uh, getting us involved and you know, getting us militarily involved uh, during the period from 1960 to 1973. In other words, had we known more about the political situation situation in Vietnam and the military situation in Vietnam, my hunch is that President Eisenhower would not have committed the numbers of troops that he did in 1960. Another this day in history, uh, private first, this is 1965, October 22nd, 1965, a private first class, Lee Olive, uh, jumped on a grenade to save uh, nearby uh, soldiers. And uh, there's a lot on this day in history in Vietnam, also on this day in history. Uh, by the way, Dr. Osterhoff, did you happen to catch yesterday's Newsmaker? We played a 1984 show with Kevin Doran uh, talking to a Vietnam veteran's wife. I'm afraid I did not. I was teaching a class at the very same time. Yes, and our website is down, WLEA.net is down. We hope to have it up by uh, the end of the day, and uh, that show will be in the uh, Newsmaker section. Um, the, the Vietnam War, um, did that happen a lot? Soldiers jumping on grenades and, uh, similar, uh, situations? A fellow who jumped on a grenade, as you say, to save some of his comrades and, you know, people who did that sort of thing, soldiers who did that often were, re uh, you know, received, uh, either a medal of honor or the silver star. Uh, did it happen often? No, it did not happen often. Most people don't jump on grenades. Uh, there was a young man uh, who uh, you know, later on in, uh, uh, in Iraq uh, did exactly that. He was from SIO, and he did receive a, uh, a Medal of Honor. But uh, no, it was really quite, uh, it was quite unusual. Uh, by the same token, what happens here, and it goes back to a little bit of what I was saying about the period between 1955 and 1960, yeah, there were American troops who were there, but they were there for the most part in a strictly, uh, you know, kind of support capacity for the new uh, South Vietnamese Army. And in 1960, when it became clear that the South Vietnamese were not going to agree to hold elections to reunite the country, which had been expected after the, 19, after the French had left, when that became clear, Ho Chi Minh uh, then encouraged South Vietnamese guerrillas. These are not North Vietnamese troops. These were South Vietnamese guerrillas called the Viet Cong to uh, uh, you know, launch what essentially became an insurgency against the South Vietnamese government. In 1960, President Eisenhower sent additional American military advisors to aid the South Vietnamese, and we remained in an advisory capacity there for about the next four years. But you know, it's important to note that many of these military advisors were with South Vietnamese units, and when they were fired upon, our advisors 
fired back. And so from 1960 until 1963, when President Kennedy was assassinated, the U.S. would send in, uh, uh, you know, increasingly numbers from about 800 in 1960 to about 16,000 men, 16,000 military advisors in 1963, obviously increasing the uh, military presence there, our, our, uh, the U.S. military presence. And then from 1963 until 1965, those numbers trend upwards until July 28 of 1965, when President Johnson made the decision to essentially Americanize the war. And he did that by, uh, by committing not a few thousand, but rather 75,000 new American troops there. And he did so because he believed that without that kind of American commitment, South Vietnam, South Vietnam would, defeat it, would be defeated by the Viet Cong, and it would eventually become part of, if you will, a communist North Korea. This is a tricky question. How do you do uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis in 60 seconds, Dr. Ostrauer? Well, the Cuban Missile Crisis begins when? It begins in 1962, uh, you know, in mid-October. And uh, I, I think that you've got to give President Kennedy a great deal of credit by not utilizing military force. We established, if you will, a blockade, it was called a quarantine, of Cuba uh, to prevent the Soviets from sending uh, missiles, uh, uh, nuclear-tipped missiles, uh, into Cuba. And uh, Kennedy was able to negotiate that a, 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 res a resolution to that crisis diplomatically, not militarily. And I think that we owe him a great, great deal of uh, honor for exactly that. I might add, by the way, that that whole issue with the Cuban crisis occurred at the same time as a revolution, an anti-communist revolution in Hungary. It was one heck of a period of... No, I shouldn't say that. That was in 1956. But in either case, it was a, uh, uh, it was a, a very, very tense period in American history. I think many of us thought that we were not going to die a natural death. Dr. Ostrar, you really summed up the uh, moment of what things were like in October of 1962. Well, that's it for today's show. Dr. Ostrar, thank you for joining us. I'll talk to you next week, Brian.